Chapter 3 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When shone the light of dawn the splendor throned, Then to the ships the Pelian spearmen bore Antilochus' course, Sore sighing for their prince, and by the Hellespont they buried him with aching hearts. Round him, groaning, stood the battle sons of Argives, all of love for Nestor, shrouded o'er with grief. But that grey hero's heart was nowise crushed by sorrow, for the wise man's soul endures bravely, and cowers not under affliction's stroke. But Peleus' son, wroth by Antilochus, his dear friend, armed for vengeance terrible upon the Trojans, yea, and these withal, despite their dread of mighty Achilles' spear, poured battle-eager forth their gates, for now the fates with courage filled their breast, of whom many were doomed to Hades to descend. Whence there is no return, thrust down by hands of Aeacus' son, who also was foredoomed that day to perish by Priam's wall. Swift meant the fronts of conflict, all the tribes of Troy's host, and the battle-biding Greeks, a fire with that new kindled fury of war. Then through the foe the son of Peleus made wide havoc. All around the earth was drenched with gore, and choked with corpses with the streams of Simois and Xanthus. Still he chased, still slaughtered, even to the city's walls, for panic fell on all the host. And now all had he slain, had dashed the gates to earth, rending them from their hinges, or the bolts hurling himself against them had he snapped, and for the Danians into Priam's burg had made a way, had utterly destroyed that goodly town. But now was Phoebus wroth against him with grim fury, when he saw those countless troops of heroes slain of him. Down from Olympus with a lion leap he came, his quiver on his shoulders lay, and shafts that deal the wounds incurable. Facing Achilles he stood, round him clasped quiver and arrows, blazed with quenchless flame his eyes, and shook the earth beneath his feet. Then, with a terrible shout, the great god cried, so to turn back from war Achilles, awed by the voice divine, and save from death the Trojans. Back from the Trojans, Peleus' son, beseems not that longer thou deal death unto thy foes, lest an Olympian god abase thy pride. But nothing quelled the hero at the voice immortal, for that round him even now hovered the unrelenting fates. He recked not of the god, and shouted his defiance, Phoebus, why dost thou in mine own despite stir me to fight with gods, and wouldst protect the arrogant Trojans? Heretofore hast thou by thy beguiling turned me from the fray, when from destruction thou at first didst save Hector, whereat the Trojans all through Troy exulted. Nay, thou get thee back, Return unto the mansion of the blessed, lest I smite thee, I, immortal though thou be. Then on the god he turned his back, and sped after the Trojans fleeing cityward, and harried still their flight. But wroth at heart, thus Phoebus spake to his indignant soul, Out on this man, he is sense bereft. But now not Zeus himself nor any other power shall save this madman who defies the gods. From mortal sight he vanished into a cloud, and cloaked with mist a baleful shaft he shot, which leapt to Achilles' ankle. Sudden pangs with mortal sickness made his whole heart faint. He reeled, and like a tower he fell, that falls smit by a whirlwind when an earthquake cleaves a chasm for rushing blast from underground. So fell the goodly form of Aeacus' son. He glared a murderous glance to right, to left upon the Trojans and a terrible threat shouted, a threat that could not be fulfilled. Who shot me a stealthy smiting shaft? Let him but dare to meet me face to face. So shall his blood and all his bowels gush out about my spear, and he be hellward sped. I know that none can meet me man to man, and quell in fight of earth-born heroes none. Though such a one should bear within his breast a heart unquelling, and have thews of brass, but dastard still in stealthy ambush lurk for lives of heroes. Let him face me then, I, though he be a god whose anger burns against the Danians, 
Yea, mine heart forebodes that this my smiter was Apollo, cloaked in deadly darkness. So in days gone by my mother told me how that by his shafts I was to die before the Scaean gates, a piteous death. Her words were not vain words. Then with unflinching hands from out the wound incurable he drew the deadly shaft in agonized pain. Forth gushed the blood, his heart waxed faint beneath the shadow of coming doom. Then in indignant wrath he hurled from him the arrow. A sudden gust of wind swept by and caught it up. And even as he trod Zeus' threshold to Apollo gave it back, for it beseemed not that a shaft divine sped forth by an immortal should be lost. He unto high Olympus swiftly came to the great gathering of immortal gods, where all assembled watched the war of men, these longing for the Trojans' triumph, those for Danian victory. So with diverse wills watched they the strife, the slayers and the slain. Him did the bride of Zeus behold, and straight upbraid with exceeding bitter words. What deed of outrage, Phoebus, hast thou done this day? Forgetful of that day whereon to godlike Peleus spousals gathered all the immortals. Yea, amidst the feasters thou sangest how Thetis silver footed left the sea's abysses to be Peleus' bride, and as thou harpest all the earth's children came to hearken, beasts and birds, high craggy hills, rivers, and all deep shadowed forest came. All this thou hast forgotten, and hast wrought a ruthless deed, hast slain a godlike man albeit thou with other gods didst pour the nectar, praying that he might be the son by Thetis given to Peleus. But that prayer thou hast forgotten, favoring the folk of tyrannous Laomedon, whose kind thou keepest. He, a mortal, did despite to thee the deathless. O oh, thou art wit bereft! Thou favorest Troy, thy sufferings all forgot! Thou wretch! And doth thy false heart know not this? What man is an offence, and meriteth its suffering? And who is honoured of the gods? Ever Achilles showed us reverence. Yea, was of our race. Ha! But the punishment of Troy, I ween, shall not be lighter, though Aeacus' son have fallen. For his son right soon shall come from Skyros to the war to help the Argive men, no less in might than was his sire, a bane to many a foe. But thou, thou for the Trojans dost not care, but for his valour envied his Peleus' son, seeing he was the mightiest of men. Thou fool! How wilt thou meet the Nereid's eyes when she shall stand in Zeus's hall midst the gods, who praised thee once and loved thee as her own son? So Hera spake in bitterness of soul, upbraiding. But he answered her not a word, of reverence for his mighty father's bride. Nor could he lift his eyes to meet her eyes, but set abashed, aloof from all the gods eternal, while in unforgiving wrath scowled on him the immortals who maintained the Danians' cause, but such as fain would bring triumph to Troy, these with exultant hearts extolled him, hiding it from Hera's eyes, before whose wrath all heaven abiders shrank. But Peleus' son the while forgot not yet war's fury, still in his invincible limbs the hot blood throbbed, and still he longed for fight. Was none of all the Trojans dared draw nigh the stricken hero, but at a distance stood, as round a wounded lion hunters stand mid forest breaks afraid, and, though the shaft stands in his heart, yet faileth not in him his royal courage, but with terrible glare roll his fierce eyes, and roar his grimly jaws. So wrath and anguish of his deadly hurt to fury stung Pleiades' soul, but I, his strength ebbed through the god-envenomed wound. Yet leapt he up, and rushed upon the foe, and flashed the lightning of his lance. It slew the goodly Arithion, comrade stout of Hector, through his temples crashing clear. His helm stayed not the long lance fury sped, which leapt there through, and won within the bones the heart of the brain, and spilt his lusty life. Then stabbed beneath the brows Hipponous, even to the eye roots that the eyeball fell to earth his soul to hades flitted forth then through the jaw he pierced alcalthous and shore away his tongue in dust he fell gasping his life out and the spear had shot out through his ear these as they rushed on him that hero slew but many a fleer's life he spilt 
for in his heart still leapt the blood but when his limbs grew chill and ebbed away his spirit leaning on his spear he stood while still the trojans fled in huddles out of panic and he shouted unto them trojan and dardan cravens ye shall not even in my death escape my merciless spear but unto my avenging spirit ye shall pay i one and all destruction's debt he spake they heard and quelled as mid the hills fawns tremble at a lion's deep mouth roar and terror-stricken flee the monster so the ranks of trojan chariot lords the lines of battle helpers drawn from alien lands quelled at the last shout of achilles deemed that he was woundless yet yet neath the weight of doom his aweless heart his mighty limbs at last were o'erborne down midst the dead he fell as falls a beetling mountain cliff earth rang beneath him clanged with thunderous crash his arms as peleus son the princely fell and still his foes with most exceeding dread stared at him even as when some murderous beast lies slain by shepherds trembles still the sheep eyeing him as beside the fold he lies and shrinking as they pass him far aloof and even as he were living fear him dead so feared they him achilles now no more yet paris strove to kindle those faint hearts for his own heart exulted and he hoped now peleus son the danian strength had fallen wholly to quench the argive battle-fire friends if ye help me truly and loyally let us this day die slain by argive men or live and hell to troy with hector's steeds in triumph peleus son thus fallen dead the steeds that grieving yearning for their lord to fight have borne me since my brother died might we with these but hail achilles slain glory were this for hector's horses yea for hector if in hades men have sense of righteous retribution this man i devise but mischief for the sons of troy and now troy's daughters with exultant hearts from all the city streets shall gather round as pantheresses wroth for stolen clubs or lionesses might stand around a man whose craft in hunting vexed them while he lived so round achilles a dead corpse at last in hurrying throngs troy's daughters then shall come in unforgiving unforgetting hate for parrots wroth for husbands slain for sons for noble kinsmen most of all shall joy my father and the ancient men whose feet unwillingly are chained within the walls by eld if we shall hail him through our gates and give our foe to fowls of the air for meat then they which feared him theretofore in haste closed round the corpse of strong hearty Achis son glaucus aeneas battle-famed agenor and other cunning men in deadly fight eager to hail him thence to ilium the god-built burg but aeas failed him not swiftly that godlike man bestrode the dead back from the corpse his long lance thrust them all yet ceased they not from onslaught thronging round still with swift rushes fought they for the prize one following other like to long-lit bees which hover round their hive in swarms on swarms to drive a man thence but he wrecking not of all their fury carveth out the combs of nectarous honey harassed sore are they by smoke reek and the robber spite of all ever they dart against him naught cares he so not of all their onslaughts aeas wrecked but first he stabbed agolus in the breast and slew that son of mehion thestor next alcinous he smote agastratus agonippus zorus nessus eurymus the war-renowned who came from like your land with mighty-hearted Clacus, from his home in Malanipion on the mountain ridge athena's fane which mysacaipon fronts anigh chaldonia's headland dreaded sword of scared seafarers when its lowering crags must needs be double for his death the blood of fame to Polycus' son was horror chilled for this was his dear friend with one swift thrust he pierced the sevenfold hides of aeas shield yet touched his flesh not stayed the spearhead was by those thick hides and by the corslet plate which lapped those battle tireless limbs but still from that stern conflict Clacus drew not back burning to vanquish aeas aeacus son 
and in his folly vaunting threatened him aeas men name thee mightiest man of all the archives hold thee in passing high esteem even as achilles therefore thou i wot by that dead warrior dead this day shalt lie so hurled he forth a vain word not knowing how far and might above him was the man whom his spear threatened battle bider aeas darkly and scornfully glaring on him said thou craven wretch and knowest thou not this how much was hector mightier than thou in warcraft yet before my might my spear he shrank i with his valour there was blent discretion thou thy thoughts are deathward set who darest defy me to the battle me a mightier far than thou thou canst not say that friendship of our fathers thee shall screen nor me thy gifts shall wile to let thee pass scatheless from war as once did tidius son though thou didst escape his fury i will not suffer thee to return alive from war ha and thy many helpers thou dost trust who with thee like so many worthless flies flit around the noble achilles corpse to these death and black doom shall my swift onset deal then on the trojans this way and that he turned as mid a long forest glen a lion turns on hounds and trojans many and lycians slew that came for honour hungry till he stood mid a wide ring of flinchers like a shoal of darting fish when sails into their midst a dolphin or shark a huge sea fosterling so shrank they from the might of telamon's son as i he charged mid the rout but still swarmed fighters up till round achilles corpse to right to left lay in dust the slain countless as boars around a lion at bay and evermore the strife waxed deadlier then to hippolochus war-wise son was slain by aeas of the heart of fire he fell backward upon achilles as falls a sapling on a sturdy mountain oak so quelled by the spear on peleus son he fell but for his rescue anchises stalwart son strove hard with all his comrades battle fain and held the course forth and to sorrowing friends gave it to bear to ilium's hallowed burg swiftly leapt he back from murderous war and hastened thence to troy there for his healing cunning leeches wrought who staunched the blood rush and laid on the gash balms such as solve war-stricken warriors pangs but aeas still fought on here there he slew with thrust like lightning flashes his great heart ached sorely for his mighty cousin slain and now the warrior king laertes son fought at his side before him blenched the foe as he smote down peasander's fleetfoot son the warrior meanalus who left his home in far-renowned abydos down on him he hurled atimnius the goodly son whom pegasus the bright-haired nymph had borne to strong amethion by granicus stream dead by his side he laid orestius son proteus who dwelt neath lofty ida's folds ah never did his mother welcome home that son from war panacea beauty famed he fell by odysseus hands who spilt the lives of many more whom his death-hungering spear reached in that fight around the mighty dead yet alcon son of megacles battle-swift hard by odysseus right knee drave the spear home and about the glittering greave the blood dark crimson welled he recked not of the wound but was unto his smiter sudden death for clear through his shield he stabbed him with his spear amidst his battle-fury to the earth backward he dashed him by his giant might and strength of hand clashed round him in the dust his armour and his corslet was disdained with crimson life-blood forth from flesh and shield the hero plucked the spear of death the soul followed the lance-head from the body forth and life forsook its mortal mansion then rushed on his comrades in his wounds despite odysseus nor from that stern battle toil refrained him and by this a mingled host of danians eager-hearted fought around the mighty dead and many and many a foe slew they with those smooth shafted ashen spears even as the winds drew down upon the ground the flying leaves when through the forest glades sweep the wild gust 
as waneth autumn tide and the old year is dying so the spears of dauntless danians strew the earth with slain for loyal to dead achilles were they all and loyal to hero aias to the death for like black doom he blasted the ranks of troy then against aias paris strained his bow but he was ware thereof and sped a stone swift to the archer's head that bolt of death crashed through his crested helm and darkness closed around him in dust down he fell nought availed his shafts their eager lord but this way and that scattered in dust empty his quiver lay flew from his hand the bow in haste his friends up caught him from the earth and hector's steeds hurried him thence to troy scarce drawing breath and moaning in his pain nor left his men the weapons of their lord but gathered up all from the plain and bare them to the prince while aeas sent after him a wrathful shout dog thou hast scaped the heavy hand of death to-day but swiftly thy last hour shall come by some strong argive's hands or by my own but now have i a nobler task at hand from murder's grip to rescue achilles course then turned he on the foe hurling swift doom on such as fought around the aeides yet these saw how many yielded up the ghost neath his strong hands and with hearts failing them for fear against him could they stand no more as rascal vultures were they which the swoop of an eagle king of birds scares far away from carcasses of sheep that wolves have torn so this way that way scattered they before the hurtling stones the sword the might of aeas in utter panic from the war they fled in huddled rout like starlings from the swoop of a death-dealing hawk when fleeing bane one drives against another as they dart all terror huddled in tumultuous flight so from the war to priam's burb they fled wretchedly clad in terror as a cloak quelling from mighty aeas battle shout as with hands dripping blood gouts he pursued yea all one after other had he slain had they not streamed through the city gates flung wide hard panting pierced to the very heart with fear pent there within he left them as a shepherd leaves folded sheep and strode back o'er the plain yet never touched he with his feet the ground but i he trod on dead men arms and blood for countless corpses lay on that wide stretch even from the broad way troy to hellespont bodies of strong men slain the spoil of doom as when the dense stalks of sun-ripened corn fall neath the reaper's hands and the long swaths heavy with full ears are spread the field and joys the heart of him who oversees the toil lord of the harvest even so by baleful havoc overmastered lay all around face downward men remembering not the death denouncing war shout but the sons of fair archaea left their slaughtered foes in dust and blood unstripped of arms a while till they should lay upon the pyre the son of peleus who in battle shock had been their banner of victory charging in his might so the kings drew him from that stricken field straining beneath the weight of giant limbs and with all loving care they bore him on and laid him in his tent before the ships and round him gathered that great host and wild heart anguished him who had been the achaean strength and now forgotten all the splendour of spears lay mid the tents by moaning hellespont in stature more than human even as lay tityos who sought to force queen leto when she fared to pytho swiftly in his wrath apollo shot and laid him low who seemed invincible in a foul lake of gore there lay he covering many a root of ground on the broad earth his mother and she moaned over her son of blessed gods aboard but lady leto laughed so grand of mould there in the foeman's land lay aeacus son for joy to trojans but for endless grief to achaean men lamenting moaned the air with sighing from the abysses of the sea and passing heavy grew the hearts of all thinking 
Now shall we perish by the hands of Trojans. Then by those dark ships they thought of white-haired fathers left in halls afar, of wives new-wedded, who by the couches cold mourned, waiting, waiting with their tender babes for husbands unreturning. And they groaned in bitterness of soul. A passion of grief came o'er their hearts. They fell upon their faces on the deep sand flung down, and wept as men all comfortless round Peleus' mighty son, and clutched and plucked out by the roots their hair, and cast upon their faces defiling sand. Their cry was like the cry that goeth up from folk that after battle by their walls are slaughtered, when their maddened foes set fire to a great city, and slay in heaps on heaps her people, and make spoil of all her wealth. So wild and high they wailed beside the sea, because the Danians' champion, Aeacus' son, lay, grand in death, by a god's arrow slain, as Ares lay, when she of the mighty father with that huge stone down dashed him on Troy's plain. Ceaselessly wailed the Myrmidons' Achilles, a ring of mourners round the kingly dead. That kind heart, friend alike to each and all, to no man arrogant, nor hard of mood, but ever tempering strength with courtesy. Then Aeas first, deep groaning, uttered forth his yearning o'er his father's brother's son, God-stricken. I, no man had smitten him of all upon the wide-weight earth that dwell. Him glorious Aeas, heavy-hearted, mourned, now wandering to the tent of Peleus' son, now cast down all his length, a giant form on the sea-sands, and thus lamented he, Achilles, shield and sword of Argive men, thou hast died in Troy, from Pythias' plains afar, smitten unawares by that accursed shaft, such thing as weakling dastards aim in fight, for none who trust in wielding the great shield, none who for war can skill to set the helm upon his brows, and sway the spear in grip, and cleave the brass about the breast of foes, warreth with arrows, shrinking from the fray. Not man to man he met thee, who so smote, else woundless never had he scaped thy lance. But haply Zeus purposed to ruin all, and maketh all our toil and travail vain. I now will grant the Trojans victory, who from Achaia now hath reft her shield. Ah, me! How shall old Peleus in the halls take up the burden of a mighty grief in his joyless age? His heart shall break at the mere rumour of it. Better so, thus in a moment to forget all pain. But if these evil tidings slay him not, ah, laden with sore sorrow, eld shall come upon him, eating out his heart with grief by a lone heart. Peleus, so passing dear once to the blessed, but the gods vouchsafe no perfect happiness to hapless men. So he in grief lamented Peleus' son. Then ancient Phoenix made heart-stricken moan, clasping the noble form of Aeacus' seed, and in wild anguish well the wise of heart. Thou art reft from me, dear child, and cureless pain hast left me, Oh, that upon my face the valling earth had fallen, ere I saw thy bitter doom! No pang more terrible hath ever stabbed mine heart. No, not that hour of exile when I fled from fatherland and noble parents, fleeing Hellas through, till Peleus welcomed me with gifts, and lord of his Dolopians made me. In his arms thee through his halls one day he bare, and sat upon my knees, and bade me foster thee, his babe, with all love, as mine own dear child. I hearkened to him, blithely didst thou cling about my heart, and babbling wordless speech didst call me father oft, and didst bedew my breast and tunic with thy baby lips. Oft times with soul that laughed for glee I held thee in my arms, for my heart whispered me, This fosterling through life shall care for thee, staff of thine aid shall be and that mine hope was for a little while fulfilled. But now thou hast vanished into darkness, and to me is left long heartache, wild with all regret. 
Ah, my sorrow slay me, ere the tale to noble Peleus come. When on his ears falleth the heavy tidings, he shall weep and wail without surcease. Most piteous grief we twain for thy sake shall inherit I, thy sire and I, who, ere our day of doom, mourning shall go down to the grave for thee. I, better this than life unholpen of thee. So moaned his ever-swelling tide of grief, and Atreus' son beside him mourned and wept, with heart on fire with inly smouldering pain. Thou hast perished, chiefest of the Danian men, hast perished, and hast left the Achaean host fenceless. Now thou art fallen, they are left an easier prey to foes. Thou hast given joy to Trojans by thy fall, who dreaded thee as sheep a lion. These with eager hearts even to the ships will bring the battle now. Zeus, father, thou too with deceitful words beguilest mortals. Thou didst promise me that Priam's burg should be destroyed, but now that promise given dost thou not fulfil. But thou didst cheat mine heart. I shall not win the war's goal. Now Achilles is no more. So did he cry heart anguished. Mourned all round with wails multitudinous for Peleus' son. The dark ships echoed back the voice of grief, and sighed and sobbed the immeasurable air. And as when long sea rollers, driven onward by a great wind, heave up far out at sea, and strandward sweep with terrible rush, and I, headland and beach, with shattered spray are scourged, and roar unceasingly. So a dread sound rose of moaning of the Danians round the course, ceaselessly wailing Peleus' aweless son. And on their morning soon black night had come, but spake unto Atreides Neleus' son, Nestor, whose own heart bare its load of grief, remembering his own son, Antilochus. O oh, mighty Agamemnon, scepter lord of Argives, from wide shrilling lamentation refrain we for this day. None shall withhold hereafter these from their heart's desire of weeping and lamenting many days. But now go to, from all this Aeacus' son, wash we the foul blood gouts, and lay we him upon a couch. Unseemly it is to shame the dead by leaving them untended long. So counseled Neleus' son, the passing wise. Then hasted he his men, and bade them set cauldrons of cold spring water o'er the flames, and wash the course, and clothe it in vesture fair, sea purple, which his mother gave her son at his first sailing against Troy. With speed they did their lord's command, with loving care, all service meetly rendered, on a couch they laid the mighty fallen, Peleus' son. The Trito born, the passing wise, beheld and pitied him, and showered upon his head ambrosia, which hath virtue I to keep taintless men say the flesh of warriors slain. Like softly breathing sleeper, dewy fresh he made him. Over that dead face she drew a stern frown, even as when he lay with wrath darkening his grim face, clasping his slain friend Patroclus. And she made his frame to be more massive, like a war-god to behold. And wonder seized the Argives as they thronged, and saw the image of a living man, where all the stately length of Peleus' son lay on the couch, and seemed as though he slept. Around him all the woeful captive maids me had taken for a prey, what time he had ravaged hallowed Lemnos, and scaled the towering crags of Thebes, Etion's town, welled as they stood, and rent their fair young flesh, and smote their breast, and from their hearts bemoaned that lord of gentleness and courtesy, who honoured even the daughters of his foes, and stricken most of all with heart-sick pain, Briseis, hero Achilles' couchmate, bowed o'er the dead, and tore her fair young flesh with ruthless fingers, shrieking, 
her soft breast was waged with gory wheels so cruelly she smote it thou hadst said that crimson blood had dripped on milk yet in her griefs despite her winsome loveliness shone out and grace hung like a veil about her as she wailed woe for this grief passing all griefs beside never on me came anguish like to this not when my brethren died my fatherland was wasted like this anguish for thy death thou wast my day my sunlight my sweet life mine hope of good my strong defence from harm dearer than all my beauty yea more dear than my lost parents thou wast all in all to me thou only captive though i be thou tookest from me every bondmaid's task and like a wife didst hold me ah but now me some new achaean master shall bear to fertile sparta or to thirsty argos the bitter cup of thraldom i shall drain severed ah me from thee oh that the earth had veiled my dead face ere i saw thy doom so for slain peleus son did she lament with woeful handmaidens and heart anguished greeks horning a king a husband never dried her tears were ever to the earth they streamed like sunless water trickling from a rock while rime and snow yet mantle o'er the earth above it yet the frost melts down before the east wind and the flame shafts of the sun now came the sound of that upringing well to nereus daughters dwellers in the depths unfathomed with sore anguish all their hearts were smitten piteously they moaned their cries shivered along the waves of hellespont then with dark mantles over paul they sped swiftly to where the argive men were thronged as rushed their troops up the silver paths of sea the flood disported round them as they came with one wild cry they floated up it rang a sound as when the fleet flying cranes forebode a great storm moaned the monsters of the deep plaintively round that train of mourners fast on they sped to their goal with awesome cry wailing the while their sister's mighty son swiftly from helicon the muses came heart burdened with undying grief for love and honour of the nerid starry-eyed then zeus with courage filled the argive men that eyes of flesh might undismayed behold that glorious gathering of goddesses then those divine ones round achilles course pealed forth with one voice from immortal lips a lamentation rang again the shores of hellespont as rain upon the earth their tears fell round the dead man aeacus son for out of depths of sorrow rose their moan and all the armour yea the tents the ships of that great sorrowing multitude were wet with tears from ever swelling springs of grief his mother cast upon him clasping him and kissed her son's lips crying through her tears now let rosy vesture dawn in heaven exult now let broad flowing axius exult and for astropaeus dead put by his wrath let priam's seed be glad but i unto olympus will ascend and at the feet of everlasting zeus will cast me bitterly plaining that he gave me an unwilling bride unto a man a man whom joyless eld soon overtook to whom the fates are near with death for gift yet not so much for his lot do i grieve as for achilles zeus promised me to make him glorious in Achaean halls in recompense for the bridal i so loathed that into wild wind i changed me now to water now in fashion as a bird i was now as a blast of flame nor might a mortal win me for his bride who seemed all shapes in turn that heaven and earth contain until the olympian placed him to bestow a godlike son on me a lord of war yea in a manner this he did fulfil faithfully for my son was mightiest of men 
but zeus made brief his span of life unto my sorrow therefore up to heaven will i to zeus's mansion will i go and well my son and will put zeus to mind of my travail for him and his sons in their sore stress and sting his soul with shame so in her wild lament the sea queen cried but now to thetis spake calliope she in whose heart was steadfast wisdom throned from lamentation thetis now forbear and do not in the frenzy of thy grief for thy lost son provoke to wrath the lord of gods and men lo even sons of zeus the thunder king have perished overborne by evil fate immortal though i be mine own son orpheus died whose magic song drew all the forest trees to follow him and every craggy rock and river stream and blasts of wind shrill piping stormy breeze and birds that dart through air on rushing wings. Yet I endured mine heavy sorrow. Gods ought not with anguish grief to vex their souls. Therefore make end of sorrow-stricken well for thy brave child. For to the sons of earth minstrels shall chant his glory and his might by mine and by my sister's inspiration unto the end of time. Let not thy soul be crushed by dark grief, nor do thou lament like those frail mortal women. Knowest thou not that round all men which dwell upon the earth hovereth irresistible, deadly fate, who wrecks not even of the gods? Such power she only hath for heritage. Yea, she soon shall destroy gold-wealthy Priam's town, and Trojans many, and Argives doomed to death whomso she will no god can stay her hand so in her wisdom spake calliope then plunged the sun down into ocean's stream and sable vestured night came floating up o'er the wide firmament and brought her boon of sleep to sorrowing mortals on the sands there slept they all the achaean host with heads bowed neath the burden of calamity. But upon Thetis' sleep laid not his hand. Still with the deathless Nereids by the sea she sate. On either side the muses spake one after other comfortable words to make that sorrowing heart forget its pain. But when, with a triumphant laugh, the dawn soared up the sky, and her most radiant light shed over all the Trojans and their king, then, sorrowing sorely for Achilles still, the Danians woke to weep. Day after day, for many days they wept. Around them moaned the far-reaching beaches of the sea, and mourned great Nerus for his daughter Thetis' sake, and mourned with him the other sea-gods all for dead Achilles. Then the Argives gave the corpse of great Pleiades to the flame. A pyre of countless tree-trunks built they up, which, all with one mind toiling, from the heights of Ida they brought down. For Atreus' sons sped on the work, and charged them bring thence wood without measure, that consumed with speed might be Achilles' body. All around piled they about the pyre much battle-gear of strong men slain, and slew and cast thereon full many goodly sons of Trojan men, and snorting steeds, and mighty bulls withal, and sheep, and fatling swine thereon they cast. And wailing captive maids from coffers brought mantles untold, all cast they on the pyre. Gold heaped they there, and amber, all their hair the Myrmidon shore, and shrouded with the same the body of their king. Briseis laid her own shorn tresses on the corpse, her gift, her last unto her lord. Great jars of oil full many pour they out thereon, With jars of honey and of wine, Rich blood of the grape that breathed an odor as of nectar, Yea, cast incense-breathing perfumes manifold, 
marvellous sweet, the precious things put forth by earth, and treasures of the sea divine. Then, when all things were set in readiness about the pyre, all, footmen, charioteers, compassed that woeful bell, clashing their arms. While from the viewless heights Olympian, Zeus rained down ambrosia on dead Aeacus' son. For honour to the goddess, Nera's child, he sent to Aeolus Hermes, bidding him to summon the sacred might of his swift winds, for that the corpse of Aeacus' son must now be burned. With speed he went, and Aeolus refused not. The tempestuous north in haste he summoned, and the wild blast of the west. To Troy they sped on their whirlwind wings. Fast in mad onrush, fast across the deep they darted, Roared beneath them as they flew the sea, the land, above crashed thunder-voiced clouds, headlong hurtling through the firmament. Then by decree of Zeus, down on the pyre of slain Achilles, like a charging host swooped they. Up leapt the fire guard's maddening breath, up rose a long well from the Myrmidons. Then through the whirlwind rushes toiled the winds, all day. All night they needs must fan the flames ere that death pyre burned out. Up to the heavens vast volume rolled the smoke. The huge tree trunks groaned, writhing, bursting in the heat, and dropped the dark gray ash all round. So when the winds had tirelessly fulfilled their mighty task, back to their cave they rode cloud charioted. Then, when the fire had last of all consumed that hero king, when all the steeds, the men slain round the pyre, had first been ravened up, with all the costly offerings laid around the mighty dead by Achaea's weeping sons, the glowing embers did the Myrmidons quench with wine. Then clear to be discerned were seen his bones, for no wise like the rest were they, but like an ancient giant's, None beside with these were blent, for bulls and steeds and sons of Troy, with all that mingled hecatomb, lay in a wide ring round his course, and he amidst them, flame devoured, lay there alone. So his companions groaning gathered up his bones, and in a silver casket laid, messy and deep, and banded and bestarred with flashing gold and Nerys daughters shed ambrosia over them, and precious nards for honour to Achilles. Fat of kine, and amber honey poured they over all. A golden vase his mother gave, a gift in old time of the wine-god, glorious work of the craftmaster fire-god, in which they laid the casket that enclosed the bones of mighty-souled Achilles. All around the Argives heaped a barrel, a giant sign upon a foreland's uttermost end beside the hellespont's deep waters wailing loud farewells unto the myrmidon's hero king nor stayed the immortal steeds of aeacus son tearless beside the ships they also mourned their slain king sorely loath were they to abide longer mid mortal men our argive steeds bearing a burden of consuming grief but fain were they to soar through air, afar from wretched men, over the ocean streams, over the sea queen's caverns, unto where divine Padarje bare that storm-foot twain, begotten of the west wind clarion-voiced. Yea, and they had accomplished their desire, but the god's purpose held them back, until from Skyros isle Achilles' fleet-foot son should come. Him waited they to welcome, when he came unto the war-host. For the fates, daughters of holy chaos, at their birth had spun the life-threads of those deathless foals, even to serve Poseidon first, and then Peleus the dauntless king, Achilles then, the invincible, and after these, the fourth, the mighty-hearted Neoptolemus, whom after death to the Elysian plain they were to bear, unto the blessed land by zeus decree for which cause though their hearts were pierced with bitter anguish they abode still by the ships 
with spirits sorrowing for their old lord and yearning for the new. Then from the surge of heavy plunging seas rose the earth shaker. No man saw his feet pace up the strand, but suddenly he stood beside the Nered goddesses and spake to Thetis, yet for Achilles bowed with grief. Refrain from endless mourning for thy son. Not with the dead shall he abide, but dwell with gods, as doth the might of Heracles, and Dionysus ever fair. Not him dread doom shall prison in darkness evermore, nor Hades keep him. To the light of Zeus soon shall he rise, and I will give to him a holy isle for my gift. It lies within the Uxine Sea. There evermore a god thy son shall be. The tribes that dwell around shall as mine own self honor him with incense and with steam of sacrifice. Hush thy laments, vex not thine heart with grief. Then, like a wind-breath, he passed away over the sea when that consoling word was spoken, and a little in her breast revived the spirit of Thetis. And the god brought this to pass thereafter. All the host moved moaning thence, and came unto the ships that brought them o'er from Hellas. Then returned to Helicon the Muses. Neath the sea, wailing the dear dead, Nerys' daughters sank. End of chapter 3「Four of the Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus, translated by Arthur S. Way, born 13 February 1847, died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nor did the hapless Trojans leave unwept the warrior king Hippolochus' hero son, but laid in front of the Dardanian gate upon the pyre the captain war renowned but him apollo's self caught swiftly up out of the blazing fire and to the winds gave him to bear away to lycia land and fast and far they bear him leap the glens of high talandrus to a lovely glade and for a monument above his grave upheaved a granite rock the nymphs therefrom made gush the hallowed water of a stream ever flowing which the tribes of men still call fair fleeting glaucus this the gods wrought for an honour to the lycian king but for achilles still the argives mourned beside the swift ships heart sick were they all with dolorous pain and grief each yearned for him as for a son no eye in that wide host was tearless but the trojans with great joy exulted seeing their sorrow from afar and the great fire that spake their foe consumed. And thus a vaunting voice amidst them cried, Now hath Cronian from his heaven vouchsafed a joy past hope unto our longing eyes, to see Achilles fallen before Troy. Now he is smitten down, the glorious host of Troy, I trow, shall win a breathing space from blood of death and from the murderous fray. Ever his heart devised the Trojans' bane. In his hands maddened I the spear of doom with gore besprent, and none of us that faced him in the fight beheld another dawn. But now, I wot, Achaia's valorous son shall flee unto the galley's shapely proud, since slain Achilles lies. Ah, that the might of Hector still were here, that he might slay the Argives one and all amidst their tents. So in unbridled joy a Trojan cried, but one more wise and prudent answered him, Thou deemest that yon murderous Danian host will straightway get them to the ships, to flee over the misty sea. Nay, still their lust is hot for fight, us will they nowise fear. Still are their left strong battle-eager men, as Aeas, as Tydeus, Atreus' sons. 
Though dead Achilles be, I still fear these. Oh, that Apollo's silver bow would end them! Then in that day were given to our prayers A breathing space from war and ghastly death. In heaven was dole among the immortal ones, Even all that helped the stalwart Danians' cause. In clouds like mountains piled they their veiled heads For grief of soul. But glad those others were who fain would speed Troy to a happy goal. Then unto Cronos' son great Hera spake. Zeus, lightning father, wherefore helpest thou Troy? all forgetful of the fair-haired bride, whom once to Peleus thou didst give to wife, midst Peleon's glens. Thyself didst bring to pass those spousals of a goddess. On that day all we immortals feasted there, and gave gifts passing fair. All this dost thou forget, and hast devised for Hellas heaviest woe. So spake she, but Zeus answered not a word. For pondering there he sat with burdened breast, Thinking how soon the Argives should destroy the city of Priam, Thinking how himself would visit on the victors ruined dread in war, And on the great sea thunder-voiced. Such thoughts were his, ere long to be fulfilled. Now sank the sun to ocean's fathomless flood, O'er the dim land of the infinite darkness stole, wherein men gain a little rest from toil. Then by the ships, despite their sorrow, supped the Argives. For ye cannot thrust aside hunger's importunate craving when it comes upon the breast. But straightway heavy and faint lithe limbs become, nor is there remedy until one satisfy this clamorous guest. Therefore these ape the meat of eventide in grief for Achilles. Hard necessity constrained them all. And when they had broken bread, sweet sleep came on them, loosening from their frames care's heavy chain, and quickening strength anew. But when the starry bears had eastward turned their heads, expectant of the uprushing light of Helios, and when woke the queen of dawn, then rose from sleep the stalwart Argive men, purposing for the Trojans' death and doom. Stirred were they like the roughly ridging sea a carrion, or as sudden rippling corn in harvest field, what time the rushing winds of the cloud gathering west sweep over it. So upon the Hellespont's strand the folk were stirred, and to those eager hearts cried Tydeus' son, If we be battle biders, friends, indeed more fiercely fight we now the hated foe, lest they take heart because Achilles lives no longer. Come with armor. Car and steed let us beset them. Glory awaits our toil. But battle-eager Aeas, answering, spake. Praise be thy words and nowise idle talk, Kindling the dauntless Argive men, Whose hearts before were battle-eager To the fight against the Trojan men, O Tydeus' son. But we must needs abide amidst the ships, Till goddess Thetis come forth of the sea, for that her heart is purpose to set here fair athlete prizes for the funeral games. This yesterday she told me, ere she plunged into sea depths. Yea, spake to me apart from other Danians, and I trow, by this her haste hath wrought her nigh. Yon Trojan men, though Peleus' son hath died, shall have small heart for battle, while myself am yet alive, and thou and noble Atreus' son the king. So spake the mighty son of Telamon, but knew not that a dark and bitter doom for him should follow hard upon those games by fate's contrivance. Answered Tydeus' son, O oh, friend, if Thetis come indeed this day with goodly gifts for her son's funeral games, then bide we by the ships, and keep we here all others. Meet it is to do the will of the immortals, Yea, to Achilles, too. Though the immortals willed it not, Ourselves must render honor grateful to the dead. So spake the battle-eager Tydeus' son, And, lo, the bride of Peleus gliding came Forth of the sea like the still breath of dawn. And suddenly was the Argive throng Where eager face they waited, 
some that looked soon to contend in that great athlete strife, and some to joy in seeing the mighty strive. Amidst that gathering, Thetis, sable stoled, set down her prizes, and she summoned forth Achaea's champions. At her hest they came. But first, amidst them all rose Neleus' son, not his desiring in the strife of fists to toil, nor strain of wrestling, for his arms and all his sinews were with grievous eld outworn, but still his heart and brain were strong. Of all the Achaeans, none could match himself against him in the folk mote's war of words. Yea, even Laertes' glorious son to him ever gave place when men for speech were met. Nor he alone, but even the kingliest of Argives, Agamemnon, lord of spears. Now in their midst he sang the gracious queen of Nerids, sang how she in winsomeness of beauty was of all the sea maids chief. Well pleased she hearkened. Yet again he sang, Singing of Peleus' bridal of delight, Which all the blessed immortals brought to pass By Pelian crest. Sang of the ambrosial feast, When the swift hours brought in immortal hands Meets not of earth, and heaped in golden morns. Sang how the silver tables were set forth in haste By Themis, blithely laughing, Sang how breathed her fest this purest flame of fire. Sang how the nymphs in golden chalices mingled ambrosia. Sang the ravishing dance twined by the graces' feet. Sang of the chant the muses raised, and how its spell enthralled all mountains, rivers, all the forest brood. How raptured was the infinite firmament, Chiron's fair caverns, yea, the very gods. Such noble strain did Neleus' son pour out into the Argives' eager ears, and they hearkened with ravished souls. Then in their midst he sang once more the imperishable deeds of princely Achilles. All the mighty throng acclaimed him with delight. From that beginning, with fitly chosen words, did he extol the glorious hero. How he voyaged and smote twelve cities, how he marched o'er leagues on leagues of land, and spoiled eleven. How he slew Telephus, and Etion's might renowned in Thebes. How his spear laid Cygnus low, Poseidon's son, and godlike Polydorus, Troilus the goodly, princely Asteropaeus. And how he dyed with blood the river streams of Xanthos, and with countless corpses choked his murmuring flow. When from the limbs he tore Lycaon's life beside the sounding river, and how he smote down Hector, how he slew Penthesilea, and the godlike son of splendor throned Dawn, all this he sang to Argives, which already knew the tale, sang of his giant mould, how no man's strength in fight could stand against him, nor in games where strong men strive for mastery. Where the swift contend with flying feet or hurrying wheels of chariots, nor in combat panoplied, and how in goodly head he far outshone all Danians, and how his bodily might was measureless in the stormy clash of war. Last he prayed heaven that he might see a son like that great sire from Siwa Skyros come. That noble song acclaiming Argives praised. Yea, silver-footed Thetis smiled, and gave the singer fleet-foot horses, given of old beside Cacus' mouth by Telephus to Achilles, when he healed the torturing wound with that same spear, wherewith himself had pierced Telephus' thigh, and thrust the point clear through. These Nestor Neleus' son to his comrades gave, and, glorying in their godlike lord, they led the steeds unto his ships. Then Thetis set amidst the athlete ring ten kine, to be her prizes for the foot-race, and by each ran a fair suckling calf. These the bold might of Peleus' tireless son had driven down from slopes of Ida, prizes of his spear. To strive for these rose up two, victory fain, Tercer the first, the son of Telamon, and Aeas of the Locrian archer's chief. These twain with swift hands girded them about with loincloths, 
reverencing the goddess bride of Peleus and the sea maids, who with her came to behold the Argives athlete sport. And Atreus' son, lord of all Argive men, showed them the turning goal of that swift course. Then these the queen of rivalry spurred on, as from the starting line like falcons swift they sped away. Long doubtful was the race. Now as the Argives gazed would Aeas' friends shout, now rang out the answering cheer from friends of Tursor. But when their eager speed close on the end they were, then Tursor's feet were trammelled by unearthly powers. Some god or demon dashed his foot against the stock of a deep-rooted tamarisk. Sorely wrenched was his left ankle, round the joint upswelled the veins high-ridged. A great shout rang from all that watched the contest. Aeas darted past exultant, ran his Locrian folk to hail their lord with sudden joy in all their souls. Then to his ships they drave the kine, and cast fodder before them. Eager helpful friends led Tursor, halting thence. The leeches drew blood from his foot. Then over it they laid soft shredded linen, ointment smeared, and swathed with smooth bands round, and charmed away the pain. Then swiftly rose two mighty-hearted ones, eager to match their strength in wrestling strain, the son of Tydeus and the giant Aeas. Into the midst they strode, and marvelling gazed the Argives on men shapen like to gods. Then grappled they, like lions, famine stung, fighting amidst the mountains or a stag, whose strength is even balanced, no whit less is one than other in their deadly rage. So these, long time in might, were even matched, till Aeas locked his strong hands round the son of Tydeus, straining hard to break his back. But he, with wrestling craft and strength combined, shifted his hip neath Telamon's son, and heaved the giant up, with a side twist wrenched free from Aeas' ankle lock his thigh. And so that with one huge shoulder heaved to earth he threw that mighty champion, and himself came down astride him. Then a mighty shout went up, but battle-stormer Aeas, chafed in mind, sprang up, hot eager to essay again that grim encounter. From his terrible hands he dashed the dust, and challenged furiously with a great voice Tydeus, not a whit that other quelled, but rushed to close with him. Rolled up the dust in clouds from neath their feet, Hurtling they met like battling mountain bulls that clashed to prove their dauntless strength and spurn the dust, while with their roaring all the hills re echo. In their desperate fury, these dashed their strong heads together, straining long against each other with their massive strength, hard panting in the fierce rage of their strife, while from their mouths dripped foam flakes to the ground. So strained they twain with gravel of brawny hands. Neath that hard grip their backs and sinewy necks cracked, even as when in mountain glades the trees dash storm-tormented boughs together. Oft Tydeus clutched at Aeas' brawny thighs, but could not stir his steadfast-rooted feet. Oft Aeas hurled his whole weight on him, bowed his shoulders backward, strove to press him down, and to new grips their hands were shifting eye. All round the gazing people shouted, some cheering on glorious Tydeus' son, and some the might of Aeas. Then the giant swung the shoulders of his foe to right, to left, then gripped him neath the waist. With one fierce heave, the giant effort hurled him like a stone to earth. The floor of Troyland rang again as fell Tydeus. Shouted all the folk, yet leapt he up, all eager to contend with giant Aeas for the third last fall. But Nestor rose and spake unto the twain, From grapple of wrestling noble sons forbear, For all we know that ye be mightiest of Argives, Since the great Achilles died. Then these from toil refrained, And from their brows wiped with their hands The plenteous streaming sweat. They kissed each other and forgot their strife. Then Thetis, queen of goddesses, gave to them four handmaidens, and though strong and aweless ones, marvelled beholding them, for these surpassed all captive maids in beauty, 
and household skill, save only lovely tressed Briseis. These Achilles captive brought from Lesbos' isle, and in their service joyed. The first was made stewardess of the feast, and lady of meats. The second to the feasters poured the wine. The third shed water on their hands thereafter. The fourth bare all away the banquet done. These tidiest son and giant Aias shared, and, parted two and two, unto their ships sent they those fair and serviceable ones. Next, for the play of fist, Idomeneus rose, for cunning was he in all athlete lore, but none came forth to meet him, yielding all to him, the elder born, with reverent awe. So in their midst gave Thetis unto him a chariot, and fleet steeds, which theretofore mighty Patroclus from the ranks of Troy drave, when he slew Sarpedon, seed of Zeus. These unto his henchmen gave Idomeneus to drive unto the ships, himself remained, still sitting in the glorious athlete ring. Then Phoenix to the stalwart Argives cried, Now to Idomeneus the gods have given a fair prize uncontested, free of toil of mighty arms and shoulders, honouring the elder-born with bloodless victory. But lo, ye younger men, another prize awaiteth the swift play of cunning hands. Step forth then, gladden great Pleiades' soul. He spake, they heard, but each on other looked, and, loath to assay the contest, all sat still, till Neleus' son rebuked those laggard souls. Friends, it were shame that men should shun the play of clenched hands, who in that noble sport have skill, wherein young men delight, which links glory to toil. Ah, that my thews were strong, as when we held King Peleus' funeral feast. I and Acastus, kinsmen joining hands, when I with godlike Polydeuces stood in gauntlet strife, in even balanced fray, and when Ancaeus in the wrestler's ring, mightier than all beside, yet feared and shrank from me, and dared not strive with me that day, for that ere then amidst the Apaean men, no battle blenches they, I had vanquished him for all his might, and dashed him to the dust by dead Amaranchus' tomb and thousands round sat marvelling at my prowess and my strength. Therefore against me not a second time raised he his hands, strong wrestler though he were. And so I won an uncontested prize. But now old age is on me, and many griefs. Therefore I bid you, whom it well beseems, to win the prize, for glory crowns the youth who bears away the meed of athlete strife. Stirred by his gallant chiding, a brave man rose, son of haughty god like Panopeus, the man who framed the horse, the bane of Troy, not long thereafter. None dared meet him now in play of fist, albeit in deadly craft of war, when Ares rusheth through the field, he was not cunning. But for strife of hands, the fair prize uncontested had been won by stout Apeius. Yea, he was at point to bear it thence unto the Achaean ships, but one strode forth to meet him, Theseus' son, the spear Menachemus, the mighty of heart, bearing already on his swift hands girt the hard hide gauntlets, which even our son Agalus on his prince's hands had drawn with courage kindling words. The comrades then of Panopeus' princely son for Apeius raised a heartening cheer. He, like a lion, stood forth in the midst, his strong hands gauntleted with bull's hide, hard as horn. Loud rang the cheers from side to side of that great throng to fire the courage of the mighty ones to clash hands in the gory play. Sooth, little spur needed they for their eagerness to fight, but ere they closed, they flashed out proving blows to what if still as theretofore their arms were limber and lithe unclogged by toil of war then faced each other and upraised their hands with ever watching eyes and short quick steps a tiptoe and ever shifting feet 
each still eluding others' crushing might. Then with a rush they closed like thunder clouds, hurled on each other by the tempest blast, flashing forth lightnings while the welkin thrills as clash the clouds and hollow roar the winds. So neath the hard hide gauntlets clash their jaws. Down streamed the blood, and from their brows the sweat blood streaked made on the flushed cheeks crimson bars. Fierce without pause they fought, and never flagged Epeius, but threw all his stormy strength into his onrush. Yet did Theseus' son never lose heart, but baffled the straight blows of those strong hands, and by his fighting craft, flinging them right and left, leapt in, brought home a blow to his eyebrow, cutting to the bone. Even then, with counterstroke, Apeius reached Acamas' temple and hurled him to the ground. Swift he sprang up, and on his stalwart foe rushed, smote his head. As he rushed in again, the other, slightly swerving, sent his left clean to his brow, his right with all his might behind it to his nose. Yet Acamas still warded and struck with all the manifold shifts of fighting craft. But now the Achaeans all bade stop the fight though eager still were both to strive for coveted victory. Then came their henchmen, and the gory gauntlets loosed in haste from those strong hands. Now drew they breath from that great labor, as they bathed their brows with sponges myriad poured. Comrades and friends with pleading words then drew them face to face, and prayed, In friendship straight forget your wrath. So to their comrades' suasion hearkened they. For wise men ever bear a placable mind. They kissed each other, and their hearts forgat that bitter strife. Then Thetis, sable stoled, gave to their glad hands two great silver bowls, the which Eunius, Jason's warrior son, in Siwas Lemnos to Achilles gave, to ransom strong Lycaon from his hands. These had Hephaestus fashioned for his gift to glorious Dionysus, when he brought his bride divine to Olympus, Minos' child, far famous, whom in the sea washed Dia's isle Theseus unwitting left. The wine god brimmed with nectar these, and gave them to his son, and Thoas at his death to Hypsipyle, with great possessions left them. She bequeathed the bowl to her godlike son, who gave them up unto Achilles for Lycaon's life. The one the son of lordly Theseus took, and goodly Epius sent to his ships with joy the other. Then their bruises and their scars did Pavalirius tend with loving care. First pressed he out black humours, then his hands deftly knit up the gashes. Salves he laid thereover, given him by his sire of old, such as had virtue in one day to heal the deadliest hurts, yea, seeming cureless wounds. Straight was the smartest sage, and healed the scars upon their brows and neath their clustering hair. Then for the archery test Oleus' son stood forth with Tercer, they which in the race erewhile contended. Far away from these, Agamemnon, lord of spears, set up a helm crested with plumes, and spake, The master shot is that which shears the hair crest clean away. Then straightway Aias shot his arrow first, and smote the helm ridge, sharply rang the brass. Then Tursa second, with most earnest heed shot. The swift shaft hath shorn the plume away. Loud shouted all the people as they gazed, and praised him without stint, for still his foot halted in pain, yet nowise marred his aims when with his hands he sped the flying shaft. Then Peleus' bride gave unto him the arms of godlike Troilus, the goodliest of all fair sons whom Hecuba had borne in hallowed Troy. Yet of his goodly head no joy she had. The prowess and the spear of fell Achilles reft his life from him, as when a gardener with a new wetted scythe mows down, ere it may seed, a blade of corn or poppy, in a garden dewy fresh and blossom flushed, which by a watercourse crowdeth its blooms, mows it ere it may reach its goal of bringing offspring to the birth, and with his scythe sweep makes its life work vain and barren of all issue, never more now to be fostered by the dews of spring. So did Pleiades cut down Priam's son, 
the godlike beautiful, the beardless yet, and virgin of a bride, almost a child. Yet the destroyer fate lured him on to war, upon the threshold of glad youth, when youth is bold, and the heart feels no void. Forthwith a bar of iron, massy and long, from the swift speeding hand did many a say to hurl, but not an Argive could prevail to cast that ponderous mass. Aeas alone sped it from his strong hand, as in the time of harvest might a reaper fling from him a dry oak bough when all the fields are parched. And all men marvelled to behold how far flew from his hand the bronze which scarce two men hard straining had uplifted from the ground. Even this Antaeus might was wont to hurl erstwhile, ere the strong hands of Hercules o'ermastered him. This with much spoil beside Hercules took, and kept it to make sport for his invincible hand, but afterward gave it to valiant Peleus, who with him had smitten fair-towered Ilium's burg renowned. And he to Achilles gave it, whose swift ships bear it to Troy, to put him high in mind of his own father, as with eager will he fought the stalwart Trojans, and to be a worthy test wherewith to prove his strength. Even this did Aeas from his brawny hand fling far. So then the Nered gave to him the glorious arms from godlike Memnon stripped. Marvelling the Argives gazed on them. They were a giant's war gear. Laughing a glad laugh that man renowned received them. He alone could wear them on his brawny limbs. They seemed as they had been moulded to his frame. The great bar thence he bore withal to be his joy when he was fain of athlete toil. Still sped the contest on, and many rose now for the leaping. Far beyond the marks of all the rest, brave Agaphenor sprang. Loud shouted all for that victorious leap. And Thetis gave him the fair battle gear of mighty Cygnus, who had smitten first Protesilaus, then had reft the light from many more, till Peleus' son slew him, first of the chiefs of grief in shrouded Troy. Next, in the javelin test, Euryalus hurled far beyond all rivals, while the folk shouted aloud. No archer, so they deemed, could speed a winged shaft farther than his cast. Therefore the Aeacid hero's mother gave to him a deep, wide silver oil flask, tamed by Achilles in possession when his spear slew Minius, and he spoiled Larnessus' wealth. Then fiery-hearted Aeas eagerly rose, challenging to strife of hands and feet the mightiest hero there. But marvelling, they marked his mighty thews, and no man dared confront him. Chilling dread had palsied all their courage. From their hearts they feared him, lest his hands invincible should all to break his adversary's face, and naught but pain be that man's need. But at the last all men made signs for battle by the Euryalus, for well they knew him skilled in fighting craft. But he too feared that giant, and he cried, Friends, any other Achaean whom ye will, blithe will I face. But mighty Aeas, no, far doth he overmatch me. He will rend mine heart, if in the onset anger rise within him. From his hands invincible I trow, I should not win to the ships alive. Loud laughed they all, but glowed with triumph joy the heart of Aeas. Gleaming talents twain of silver he from Thetis' hands received, his uncontested prize. His stately height called to her mind her dear son, and she sighed. They which had skill at chariot driving then rose at the contest summons eagerly. Menelaus first, Eurypylus bold in fight, Eumelus, Thoas, God-like Poepoetes, harnessed their steeds, and led them to the cars, all panting for the joy of victory. Then rode they in glittering chariot rank out to one place, to a stretch of sand, and stood ranged at the starting line. The reins they grasped in strong hands quickly, while the chariot steeds shoulder to shoulder fretted, all afire to take the lead at starting, pawed the sand, pricked ears, and o'er their frontlets flung the foam. With sudden stiffened sinews those car-lords lashed with their whips the tempest-footed steeds. 
Then, swift as harpies, sprang they forth. They strained furiously at the harness, onward whirling, the chariots bounding ever from the earth. Thou couldst not see a wheel track, no, nor print of hoof upon the sand. They verily flew. Up from the plain the dust clouds to the sky soared, like the smoke of burning, or a mist rolled round the mountain forelands by the might of a dark south wind or the west, when wakes a tempest, when the hillsides stream with rain. Burst to the front your milius steeds, behind close pressed the team of godlike Thoas. Shouts still answered shouts that cheered each chariot, while onward they swept across the wide wade plain. Section of Manuscript Missing From hallowed Ellis when he had achieved a mighty triumph, in that he outstripped the swift ear of Oanomaeus, evil soul, the ruthless slayer of youths, who sought to wed his daughter Hippodomeia, passing wise. Yet even he, for all his chariot lore, had no such fleet-foot steeds as Atreus' son. Far slower. The wind is in the feet of these. So spake he, giving glory to the might of those good steeds, and to Atreides self, and filled with joy was Menelaus' soul. Straightway his henchmen from the yoked bands loosed the panting team, and all those chariot lords who in the race had striven now unyoked their tempest-footed steeds. Podalerius then hastened to spread salves over all the wounds of Thoas and Eurypylus. Gashes scored upon their frames when from the cars they fell, but Menelaus with exceeding joy of victory glowed when thetis lovely tressed gave him a golden cup the chief possession once of etion the godlike ere achilles spoiled the far-famed burg of thebes then horsemen riding up on horses came down to the course they grasped in hand the whip and bounding from the earth bestrode their steeds the while with foaming mouths the courses champed the bits and pawed the ground and fretted high to dash into the course Forth from the line swiftly they darted, eager for the strife, wild as the blast of roaring Boreas, or shouting notice, when with hurricane swoop he heaves the wide sea high, when in the east uprises the disastrous altar star, bringing calamity to seafarers. So swift they rushed, spurning with flying feet the deep dust on the plain. The riders cried, each to his steed, and ever plied the lash, and shook the reins about the clashing bits. On strained the horses, from the people rose a shouting, like the roaring of a sea. On, on across the level plain they flew, and now the flashing-footed Argive steed by Stentilus bestridden had won the race, but from the course he swerved, and o'er the plain once and again rushed wide. Nor Capaneus' son, good horseman though he were, could turn him back by rein or whip, because that steed was strained still to the race-course. Yet of lineage noble was he, for in his veins the blood of swift Arion ran, the foal begotten by the loud piping west wind upon a harpy, the fleetest of all earth-born steeds, whose feet could race against his father's swiftest blast. Him did the blessed to address us give, and from him sprang the steed of Stentilus, which Tydeus' son had given unto his friend in hallowed Troyland. Filled with confidence in those swift feet his rider led him forth unto the contest of the steeds that day, looking his horsemanship should surely win renown. Yet victory gladdened not his heart in that great struggle for Achilles' prizes. Nay, swift albeit he was, the king of men by skill outraced him, shouted all the folk, Glory to Agamemnon! Yet they acclaimed the steed of valiant Stentilus and his lord, for that the fiery flying of his feet still won him second place, albeit off wide of the course he swerved. Then Thetis gave to Atreus' son, while laughed his lips for joy, God sprung Polydorus' breastplate, silver wrought. To Stentilus, Astropaeus' massy helm, two lances, and a tasselet strong she gave. Yea, and to all the riders who that day came at Achilles' funeral feast to strive, she gave gifts. But the son of the old warlord, Laertes, inly grieved to be withheld from contest of the strong, how fain so e'er by that sore wound which Alcon dealt to him in the grim fight around Dede Achis' son. End of chapter 4